So I had a video come out earlier this week showing some of the damage that I received from that first round of freezing temperatures we got and some of our great viewers slash subscribers give me a little education on some things. So in that video I was explaining how the temperature said it only got down to 27 degrees and I've seen it get much colder and seen my cool weather crops in previous years survive much cooler temperatures than that. However, in this case, down to just 27, I received a good bit of damage. And um, I showed pictures of the ice. It wasn't just like a little thin layer. I had like big ice crystals, little spikes all over the stuff. And um, someone mentioned that that's called hoar frost. H-O-A-R frost. And, uh, no, I don't have any one-liner jokes for that, but uh, that's uh, that's what it's that's like the technical scientific term for it, and uh, it's evidently caused by really high humidity. You get a lot of moisture. I guess it freezes, and then more moisture accumulates, and that's how you get those kind of spikes. I did notice we had a lot more damage on our beets and our garden than we normally have with that type of temperature. And a lot of the people that commented, they said, man, same thing. A lot of people in North Florida, South Georgia, South, Mid-Alabama said that they grow a fall garden every year, and they never seen it take the damage it took with just that 27 degrees. The, the other theory that's out there, and I think this is probably pretty plausible too, is if you think about it, the week leading up to that, and this is kind of why it snuck up on me, the week leading up to that, shoot, we were in the mid-70s, up to a high 70, uh, yeah, you know, 78 one day, and the plants just weren't prepared for it. They weren't acclimated. Hardened off. They weren't hardened off, and uh, it just shook them, yeah. shook them for a loop. One of the things that did do fairly well was this lettuce here. Now, uh, you can see a little bit of damage there. See some right there on that uh, Skyfox butterhead. You can see a little what I call, I don't know what the technical term is, but a little silvering of the leaves there um, on this Harmony butterhead. But for the most part, still edible lettuce. Now, this if you were selling this at a market stand, you might get some people turn their nose up at it a little bit, but um, for, still a lot of good lettuce. For home lettuce garden use, uh, not really nothing wrong with it. Yeah, if you were selling this in the market, what you could do and what I used to do, you can strip away those bad leaves and just have a nice compact head there. But this, this is my favorite types of lettuce, the Harmony and then the Skyfos, both butterheads, just a red and green version there and just the, the texture and flavor of it is what I really like. I brought us a little snack here to have. You know, I remember the first time a few years ago that I grew lettuce, I just got carried away with it. And I grew a lot more than what I actually needed. Once you get the hang of growing lettuces, man, you get carried away because they look so good in the garden this time of the year. And plus, they respond to fertilizer really well. Your weed pressure normally is not very high. And they're just easy to grow, and they're enjoyable to grow, and they're pretty to grow. And you just get carried away growing them. They're good to eat. Yeah. And uh, I always grew way too many. And you, you know, you give away what you could, and, and you can only eat so much salad. But it's one of those things that I think is highly misunderstood growing in the garden for the home gardener. You know, a lot of people around here don't grow a lot of it. Somebody else in that video said, well, how did your neighbors and their gardens do? And I said, well, to be honest, you ride down the road by my house, if you see a garden, there's usually two things in it this time of year. There's probably some few onions and there's some mustard greens, maybe some turnips. That's it. A lot of the older gardeners around here don't grow a huge diversity of stuff for whatever no, reason. No, lettuce is, is at the top of the list for a winter garden. Should be. So this butterhead type is my favorite for making wraps. And I'll wash this a little bit. We might, now you mentioned the different, a little bit uh, of grid on the different ones. These have been your favorite. And these are beautiful. But, you know, as far as texture goes, you got several different textures and colors of lettuce all the way to the romaines, which have a totally different texture or leaf structure than these do. And some of these have some very unique color into them as well. So just from an ornamental standpoint of making your garden look good, these lettuces really pop. Yep, so I'm going to go with the green. You want to try some of the red? Yeah. I just got me a nice little bun right there. 
You didn't wash mine very well, did you? Well, I, I just rinsed it off. I didn't want to tear it apart, so I wanted everybody to be able to see how big the heads are. Now, I got some mayo here, but I think I'm going to go in with a little ranch. Um, a little chicken strip here. Maybe another one right there. Well, in there on that one. I don't think it's going to hurt me, is it? No, it won't hurt you. But this is a good little quick meal right here. And uh, if you have grilled chicken strips, you can do this kind of low carb. I like to do it with shrimp sometimes. Put shrimp in there and uh, just wrap that baby up. Mm. This is what they call good and healthy for you. You know, they tell us we need to stay away from bread if you're watching your figure like what I am. Mm-hmm. Pretty good stuff right there. Yeah, you're not a big fan of the romaines? Yeah, I like the romaines. They're just, uh, they don't hold as well, in my opinion, in the field like these do. These hold really well. And the remains, to me, you really don't want to harvest them till you got that kind of nice heart there on them. With these, you can harvest them small, kind of any size you want to. So you just got a little more harvest flexibility with these butter heads here um, than you do the others. Yeah. You didn't want any mayonnaise on yours? Oh, I put some ranch on there. Oh, you put some ranch on yeah. there? All right, that works. So, had that rough frost. Um, I got broccoli, cauliflower. I don't know if it's going to make it. Cab cabbage took a beating. I noticed that commercial cabbage down the road didn't look like it took as much of a beating. Um, my little cabbage trial that I did, I didn't have noticed so far in comparing those four varieties. That Cheers cabbage, which is a hybrid, more kind of commercial variety, it, uh, it smokes the others. Um, that's the one I grew those real big heads of last year, and that's just uh, that's the best cabbage variety of all the ones I've tried. It's just a good I had to agree. I grew it last year, too, and I, I really enjoyed it. No, it's not the earliest. We have earlier varieties, but as far as making a big, big head of cabbage, that Cheers is the way to go. Uh, what else we got going on here? A lot of people have been asking about red snapper tomatoes and Tachi tomatoes. Um, they are on the way here. I had a shipping confirmation earlier this week. There was a little bit of a delay there with the pelleting process, uh, which can take a little while. And there's only a few companies in the country that pellet stuff, and I imagine they pretty backed up with all the uh, increase in seed demand. So we got those on the way and uh, should have plenty of them, of uh, both of those. So. Um, if you want to go online, you can put your email in on those product pages and get the email as, as soon as uh, those are back in stock. Potatoes. We talked about, we alluded to the fact that potatoes might be allowed to be pre-ordered soon. i uh, put this down here, okay? Sure. And so, was it late last week we put potatoes back on the site for pre-order? We did, and uh, had a couple of conversations with the tater man since then. And because uh, we've sold a lot of potatoes. Everything looks good. Still on track. January 15th. And, you know, a lot of people have questions about these potatoes. Some new gardeners never grown them before. And I would highly recommend if you're new to gardening, you got to grow some potatoes. Although they are in the nightshade family, we normally don't recommend nightshades as being the easiest vegetable to grow. Potatoes, to me, are just easy. There again, like the lettuces, you grow them at a time of the year where you don't have a lot of other things competing against them. Weed pressure's not normally really bad. Besides a few beetles, you normally don't have any insect problems. Sometimes we have a little blight, but if you do a good rotation, you got a new garden, you shouldn't have much issue with that. So I'd highly encourage you, if you're new to gardening, grow you some potatoes. It's going to be highly rewarding. You're going to be so proud of yourself when you go to dig them up, and it's like... Uh, it's like digging nuggets. It's like treasure hunting when you get to mm -hmm. dig them up. So we we plan on having them in the first shipment in January 15th. We will, out of doubt, have the potatoes shipped to you by the time you need them for planting. Even down, I had this conversation the other day, even down in Florida, Zone 9, I don't think you need to plant potatoes before February 1st. Well, some of them plant into January. Well, into January, January 1st. Let's give it a week or so there. But if we get them in the 15th and get them in the mail to you, you should have man, plenty of time to plant. We will ship those people in Zone 9 first, 9 and 10 if we have any 10s. There's not a lot of 10s out there in the United States. 
that would be around Miami. We got a few. But we will ship 9 to 10, zone 9 to 10 out first. As soon as we get them in, we'll go to zone 8. We'll start shipping zone 8 next. That way, for sure, you're going to have your taters probably at least a week or two before you even need them. And then we'll kind of move up the register from there. So the, to answer the question is, we will ship them in time for you to have them. Now, we may ship them 30 days before you need them. If we see a window or opportunity where we got some warm weather and the shipping channels out there, we may go ahead and ship them. And then you can put them in your garage in a dark place and store them until you need to plant them. So don't worry about the fact that if you're going to have them in time, we will give them to you there in plenty of time. Yeah, the, I had a, quite a few people from up north. They saw where we were going to start shipping mid-January, and they were worried that we was going to ship them taters in mid-January and that they was going to have to do something with them for two, two and a half months. Well, we can't ship them if it's freezing between here and there. So we ain't going to be able to get them up there mid-January anyways. We no. probably won't have a window to get them up there until a month or so later. So the chances of you receiving them a month early is going to be pretty rare. You'll probably, uh, as the weather cooperates, get them just a few weeks maybe before you're ready to plant. Yeah, and even if you do get them a month before it's ready to plant, don't stress, just put them in a nice dark spot that's not going to freeze. If you got an enclosed carport, that would do it a lot of times. Anywhere that's not going to freeze, but it's a nice, cool, dark spot, and they'll be fine till you get ready. So the other big question, especially for people who have not done it before, is when to plant potatoes. You're going to want to plant them two weeks before your last frost date. That's first, ideal. First frost date. Last. We just had our first frost. You're going to plant them two your weeks. first one in your springtime. How about that one? Your last frost in springtime. It would be your last frost in springtime. I Come stayed, on now. I stayed Come on now. Yeah. So two weeks before your last frost in the springtime, because it's going to take them a little while to sprout, so they can sit in the ground if there's a frost. You just don't want to frost on them once they come up, and that's the way to kind of time it uh, pretty good is two weeks before your average last Yeah, there's frost. a little bit of play there. To give you an example on that, the old timers run here say Valentine's Day for us. Mm -hmm. I always wait two weeks, week and a half, two weeks later, and I plant mine in the February. So don't get all caught up and being on the exact date. As long as you're within that two to three week window in there, you're going to be fine. Do it when you have the opportunity to do it when the weather permits. So how much does somebody need to plant them? A say, thirty or forty foot row. A lot of people ask that. Well, let's just take for granted uh, five pounds, and there's some variances to this because some potatoes have more eyes on the potato, and some potatoes are bigger, and there's less potatoes than five pounds, but we sell these things on weight. Five pounds, normally speaking, is going to plant somewhere around 25 feet, wouldn't you say? Something like that. I would say a, a 10 pound, if you plant in a 40 foot row, a 10 pound bag is going to be safe for you. I have seen instances where I could squeeze five pounds on 40 foot row, but it's not always 10 pounds is going to be safe for a 40 foot row. That's assuming you cut up your taters. Now you plant whole taters, they ain't going to go near as far, but assuming you're cutting them up one to two eyes per piece, 10 pounds is going to be plenty for a 40 foot row. That does vary with variety. The Yukon Golds, you don't get as many pieces on them, I find as like the fingerlings. Those fingerlings that are long and slender, you can cut them up quite a few pieces. So it varies a little bit with variety, but I'd say five pounds for 20 to 25 foot row, 10 pounds for a 40, yeah, 50 foot row. The normal, the normal on spacing on sea potatoes is anywhere from 18 inches. That's somewhere right. in there. I'm talking about within the row. Now my row spacing apart I'll go anywhere up to 40 inches on that. I think anywhere from 36 to 40 inches is pretty much perfect on that one. Yeah, I like to go, I've done three foot. I like to go four foot because uh, you get too close, you run out of dirt to heal with there in the middle. So I like that. I like to spread mine out a little bit. We got a few new varieties this year. So we got uh, all but one of the same varieties we had last year. We don't have the all blue anymore. We got a very suitable replacement. So we got... Um, seven varieties we carried last year plus three new varieties. We also have the samplers, which are extremely popular. If you can't decide what you want or you got a little smaller garden, you just want to plant a little 
10, 20 foot row. Those uh, samplers work great. We got a gourmet sampler and then what we call our homestead sampler. Each sampler contains approximately 2.5 pounds of four different varieties there. So that's a good one, uh, good option there. The new ones we've got this year, we've got one called Purple Viking. And this is a, it's a purple slash red mottled potato on the outside, but uh, kind of cream colored potato on the inside, uh, really renowned for its taste and flavor um, and its appearance also. I've heard some people say that the best way to describe it, it's got splashes of purple in there or splashes of red. On it the is, outside. You yeah. know, when you first see the purple vodka, you think it's a purple potato, but it's maybe just purple on the outside. It is a mid-season potato. Mm -hmm. And it is drought tolerant and uh, has that bright, creamy flesh, produces a large potato. And that's unusual about this variety here. It's known for its real, what they call honkers, big potatoes there. And one way you can kind of control that is planting them closer together, probably around eight inches. Crowd them in just a little bit so they don't make such a big potato. If if your goal is to plant just a nice size, what we call table stock uh, potato. Or you can plant a whole potato instead of cutting them up. That'll give you a few more smaller potatoes as opposed to bigger ones. And it is an egg Yep. Yeah. Uh, we got the Irish cobbler, excuse me. Irish cobbler, which is an heirloom also. And it dates back to the late 1800s. Now, where the Irish cobbler name came from, they believed they, the Irish cobblers. Uh, -uh shoemakers. Well, I was wondering if you knew that. Uh -huh. They think brought this potato in with them from Ireland when they come into the United States and they think it descended from the Irish cobbler, which would be the shoemaker. Mm -hmm. And then we got the Purple Majesty. Now, we don't have the all blue this year, but the reason we got this one, Purple Majesty was actually developed from crossing an all blue potato with what they call a chipping potato. You know what a chipping potato uh, is? I do. Tater they use to make tater chips. That's exactly right. So they cross those two, and basically you have the color and anthocyanin uh, there of the all blue potato, but you've got some improved flavor that comes from that chipping potato. There. It being an oblong potato, lends itself well for being a good fryer, and they talk about making chips out of them. Now, it has that satiny purple skin to it, and it has that bright uh, bright purple flesh to it. It's newly released out of Colorado, and it probably has one of the highest antioxidants of any of the potatoes out there, and it's due to that dark purple color into them, and we all know antioxidants is good for you. Now, the downside of this potato, it probably has one of the shortest stored uh, ranges for it. It didn't store as well as most of the other potatoes, but we view this one as a boutique potato, and that's not the staple that you're going to grow anyway to store on out in the summertime. Most of the time, you eat these up pretty quick. That's right. So, go online, get your taters booked, uh, and we'll get them shipped to you in plenty of time for you to plant them. Um, like I said, 10 different varieties, plus we got those two samplers there. And uh, as far as the individual varieties go, we've got 5, 10, 25, and 50 pound offerings there. So make sure you go ahead and book those before um, we run out at some point, which will inevitably happen. Uh, one more thing to mention with uh, Christmas on the horizon. We do, a lot of people ask, do we have gift certificates? Heck yeah. Yes, we do. We have uh, what we call digital gift certificates. And if you go to our homepage, you'll see a, a big button there that says gift certificate. And uh, you can specify any amount you like. If you want to give somebody a gift certificate for uh, 24 cents, you could do that. You could do any any amount you I like. I got a couple of neighbors I'd like to give 24 cents to. <laughs> or you wouldn't give 24 cents no, for? No, I wouldn't give 24 cents for you. Yeah. <laughs> so you can specify any amount, and then when you get to the checkout page, you can, if you want to like hand deliver or manually email this to them, you can have the coupon code sent to you, or you can uh, provide their email address, and it will automatically send that coupon code redeemable for the amount you purchase. Really simple, really easy. Doesn't take any paper or any plastic cards. We do it all electronically. Time for some new varieties. Let's carry you a little bit there. You did. Okay, I'm pretty excited about some of these because these are a lot of the ones that um, you know, we asked when we were kind of 
picking new varieties, we asked a lot of our subscribers to, to give us suggestions, things they wanted to see us carry, and a lot of these are ones that were highly suggested by our subscribers, and uh, always, always like to make the people happy, you know? So let's start off with some watermelons. And we got this one right here called Carolina Cross 180. Now this is the one, if you're gonna take some watermelons to the county fair, or you're gonna try to uh, out-compete your buddies with, this is the one you wanna grow right here. If you jog your memory a little bit, do you remember the year we grew them and you was a teenager, I believe? I do, we couldn't hardly pick them up. We couldn't get, it took both of us, all we could do was some of them to get them up. Mm -hmm. It's the only year I ever grew, it's a great novelty item to grow, but I can tell you what, it really was hard to get them out of the field. Them things got huge. Yeah, yeah. Now they, they're supposedly really good to eat, uh, it's not like just growing something big to be big. They've got good flavor on them, uh, but they can get up to 200 pounds. Yeah, and it's a, to me it was a later maturing variety. It took it seemed like it took them forever. The pack says 90 days, but I can remember thinking, man, are these things ever gonna get ripe? Yeah. So big oblong shaped Looks like watermelon. a giant jubilee. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of jubilee, we just added that one as well. Uh, I don't have that one right here with me. But we do got Jubilee now. So a lot of people are wanting this giant watermelon seed, just kind of fun to grow. Don't know that you'd want to grow a whole field of them, but it might be fun to do a little plot yeah. for some kids and uh, see if somebody can go out there and pick one up or not. Also, what would be fun to do is you buy some of these and tell your neighbor you bet you could grow a bigger watermelon than him. <laughs> and, uh, and guarantee you're successful with that. Um, this other one here. Congo, well, that's an old variety. There's right an there. older variety that a lot of people really, really like. It, it has one of the higher sweetness ratings of a larger watermelon. These can get up to 50 pounds or so, but they're, they're one of the sweetest of the bigger watermelons. Oblong shape on those, and uh, a lot of people were asking about Congo. Congo is a good watermelon. Now, I would have to say, if my memory serves me right, it probably didn't have the thickest rind on there and didn't lend itself well to long term shipping. Like if you was going to ship them on a rail car, like back in the day, I think they used to have a little problem with them bruising. But it would be a great variety to grow in the home garden. They used to grow for the market back in the 60s. Yeah, I don't imagine many of our viewers are shipping watermelons on rail cars. No, but they used to ship a lot of them around here. And what, what got me back there was I can remember it, uh, the old timers talk about the 60s. And I can actually remember the early 70s where they did load them on a rail, uh, rail car and send them out of here. A little bit of a bumpy ride, I imagine. Yep. So we've got the Congo watermelon. What's next? This one I'm kind of excited about. I almost want to grow some of these. Pink banana jumbo squash. Mm, so a lot of people have be been talking about these. These things can get two to three foot long and up to 50 pounds. It's gotta be good. So just a massive, massive winter squash. Be really good uh, tasting. And um, those just look, look fun to grow. And you can make a lot of pies out of one mm. or two of them. Then we've got the this pumpkin right here called the tree amble pumpkin. And I... Uh, my wife buys one or two of these every year from a local farmer's market or wherever she can find them for decoration. They're real popular for decoration. They call them tree amble because it's got those, tri means three, it's got those three lobes on it there. Other than that, the blue bayou would be, or the uh, Jerrydale. Right, yeah. So this is a really, really good eating pumpkin. So she had one she bought somewhere. She had it sitting on the porch for decoration. And then uh, when all the other pumpkins rotted, all the jack lanterns and everything, this puppy right here was still storing good. I quartered it up. We put it in the oven. She made some pumpkin muffins out of it that were absolutely fine. Uh, in my opinion, one of the best eating pumpkins you'll find right here. And like I said, you can grow them, you can decorate with them, and then once you, you, you're done decorating, you eat them up, freeze the meat, cook the meat, whatever you want to do. What about some Jing Orange Okra? Jing Orange Jean, Okra. Jean. This is another variety that uh, a lot of people said that they really like for being tender at longer lengths, uh, that they've grown a lot. It's a Chinese heirloom variety and uh, excited to have this one. We have this one in quarter pounds, I think maybe even pounds as well. I know we got it in quarter pounds I may grow that on the side. That's, that, that, I think that would be the one for me right there. So Jean Orange, Let's see that baby. that's another one a lot of people wanted to see. And then this guy right here, for you 
patio gardeners or uh, your, your small raised bed gardeners, this one is going to be one that you guys are wanna, going to want to grow. This is called Parisian Gherkin Cucumber. So it's not like the tiny little gherkins like you've seen, like the little sour melons. It's a smaller cucumber. It's only going to get a few inches long there. Really nice, crisp, and cu crunchy. Supposed to be great for pickling. Uh, just loads up. The awesome thing about this is the plants don't get very big. So they just load up. You can grow them in a pot and um, just a bunch of little kind of miniature pickles there. And um, just really, really good stuff. So if you got a small patio garden or whatever, that Parisian gherkin is going to be a good one for you. So go check well, those out well. on the website. It's getting close to Christmas time. It is. Everybody's Christmas time. Thinking, man, what can I buy for my spouse, for my child, who loves the garden, my neighbor that I like? And uh, whoever. Teacher, you, could who, be a teacher, teacher, teacher a preacher, you. could be Sunday school teacher, could yeah. be anybody. Whoever you got on your list that you got need to buy something for, we're going to give you some great ideas today that we call the Hoss Best Gift Ideas and Best Gift for gardeners. Yeah, we ain't going to break the bank doing this. We, these are all stuff within the normal gift range. Now, I will say one of the most popular gifts is a, a wheel hoe. A lot of people ask for that for Christmas. you got to be a special person. you got to be a special yeah. person to get a wheel hoe or cedar for Christmas. But uh, these are things that are uh, a little more uh, in the budget for as far as a small gift and just making somebody feel special. So let's start out here. i got some, got a bunch of stuff. Uh, so people always ask me, they said, man, that, that table y'all got, it it's just huge. must have unlimited <laughs> storage in there. I mean, you could hide a, you could sleep a in small there. family in there. You could really, uh, two of my youngins could sleep in there if they wanted to. They might hit the head. So let's start off first, number one, with our 48 cell seed starting kit. Now we've got several different seed starting kits on the site. But I think for a, a new upstart gardener uh, or somebody who's just got kind of a smaller garden, you got 48 plants. You think that's a pretty decent sized garden. You split 48 into three, you grow 16 peppers, 16 tomatoes, 16 eggplant. You got a pretty good sized little spread there. Um, so this is a great little kit here. You get your garden markers. Yep. Uh, label that with you get your seed start mix which is enough to fill both these trays you get your little fertilizer there to hit them once they get going and then you got your nice trays here with your domes let's you break this down when everybody can get an idea what's going on here and you know what you ain't got to wait till springtime to plant those tomatoes and peppers these things are great for starting lettuces in mm -hmm. so there you go start your plants there put your humidity dome on there that humidity dome is going to trap that moisture in there and help your seeds germinate. When your seeds germinate, you need to take that humidity dome off as they start coming up and put it in some direct sunlight, whether it be outside. If you got a window sill, a big enough window sill, maybe put it close to that or either under a grow light, and boom, boom, they take off. Put some of that fertilizer on them and get out of the way. Boom, boom. Everything you need comes with good instructions, great little gift kit, everything but the seeds. Uh, in that kit right now. I believe now. this is enough seed start mix to do how many grows out of this? At least both trays once. Uh, you might have a little bit left over there. Yep. yep. And we have this on the website so you can order more of it. That's right. Got your little scoop in there so you measure out your fertilizer once they get going. All that good stuff. All right. Numero doso here. And this is not one particular item but several variations of the same item so we've got uh somebody on a um, row by row group the other day was saying they wanted to buy put together some little seed collections for some of their friends for christmas or whatever and what seeds would you put in it and i said well we've already did it for you that's right and um we do have i will say we do have a hard time keeping these stocked on the website but we've got several good collections here we got a sunflower collection, heirloom garden, heirloom seeds collection, pollinator collection, herb collection. The herb collection is really popular. The fresh salad collection and the cool season garden collection. So lots of good options there. 
Hopefully when we get our new building built, we can add even more collections to the lineup. But each one contains, I think, at least six packets of seeds. You could take one of these things, especially this heirloom garden collection, that's enough seeds for a good 30 by 30 garden right there. At a great price point, I think they're $19.99. Something like that, 19 to $24.99, I can't oh, remember. Some but you do save by get them, uh, getting them all bundled together here. Nice little collectible tin. Yep. So you open it up, you got your seeds in there. And uh, this is nice because what you don't use, you can put them back in there, put that in the fridge. Good stocking stuffer. How about that? Good, good little stocking stuffers. Lots of good options there. Number three, I really like this. I have been using this or components of it a lot of, uh, within the last year. This our complete fermentation kit. This has got everything you need but the mason jars to make your own fermented vegetables, whether it be sauerkraut, um, pickles. You can ferment just about anything you can imagine. And this has got the pickle packer, the tamper in there. Wait. It's got a really nice little instruction booklet in there like not just some old kind of something that's going to get wet and go bad. It's like a, almost like a book. And um, just everything in there. I really like this kit. I think this makes an awesome gift. It's nice and square. It wraps good. Yep. Um, I would say we didn't rank these, but this would be towards the top of my list is what I think would just make an awesome yeah, gift. Yeah, on the side of the box kind of sums it up. It says, hassle-free fermentation. Make your own superfoods the easy way. Yep. And there's enough in there to do four jars at a time. Yep. Number four, you got right there, I think. That guy. Woo, we don't have a lot of these in stock. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. We got them ordered, but we don't have well, a lot of stock. We spend selling a lot of them. Yeah, these are pretty popular. Uh, probably our most popular harvest in basket or whatever we uh get these things in by the pallet and they fly out of here yeah we got another one we're going to show in a minute it's the same way uh, this is a this is a good one right here this is what we call our over the shoulder harvesting bucket if you've watched a lot of our videos you've seen us use this it's got straps on it so stray strap over here this is right here got hands free harvesting going on you picking okra you picking tomatoes uh, corn Corn. Man, there's a lot of different uh, things you can use it for. Yeah, just Put about your babies anything. in there. Yeah, and even if you're not wearing it like this, it, it makes just a good little uh, bucket to haul what you're picking in the garden. And when you get back to the barn, you can wash them in it because it's just ideal for washing your vegetables also. Yeah. Hey, what's it not good for? We do sell quite Maybe a few USA, of those. by the way. Number five. We got what is number five? Our Hoss Garden Gloves. Look what I got on one here. Now y'all ain't got to believe me on this, but I'm gonna tell you. And if you buy some and you don't like them, you can send them back to me. Uh, but this is the most comfortable gloves for gardening you will ever wear. I have for the last two weeks. I've kept them in my pocket, 24/7. Yep. I don't mean to be it. Mm -hmm. No, I keep them in the bed. But that, well, the I top of them there, them, so the, the top here has this kind of stretchy material, as you can see there, which makes them fit tighter in your hands, flip your hand over. And then this has got some nice padding there, give you some cushion uh, on there. Yeah, we got them several different sizes, and I wear extra large. I can wear large, but uh, sometimes I'm between a large and extra large, depending on my my hands are swollen up that day. Uh, we got them in red. We have them in this kind of light green color there. And what I like about it is that you've got really good dexterity. It's not like them old, uh, what I call chainsaw gloves. Them old gloves we used to use when um, cutting firewood and yeah, stuff. I mean, you can use these for driving gloves. They're so nimble. Nimble, lots nimble. of dexterity. If you need some gloves, that's another good stocking stuffer right there. Look what we got right here. A garden hod. Now this is a hot, hot item right here. We just got a shipment in a few days ago. And I went back there and looked, and they're going like hotcakes. For some reason or other, I don't know Around why. Around holiday time. We sell worlds of these things on Amazon. They are flying out of here. No doubt we'll be sold out before Christmas. So if you think you want your garden hod to give away, you better do it, and you better do it quick. They are a little bit more, uh, they're not 
uh, they you can get them cheaper on our site than you can get them on Amazon. You can, but if you got credit card points or something like that, or you need to use Amazon, they are on Amazon under the Hoss brand. Yeah. So it's a great gift. We have a lot of people every year buy these things and give them away from gifts, and they'll come back the next year and say, I want to get some more of those Hoss because they, the women folks absolutely Women folks go crazy them. for these things yep. right here. Um, Made in USA. Put all kinds of stuff out. I, I see, heard a lot of them. We used to do trade shows. When folks they say that's too pretty for me to to get dirty in the garden, I'm going to use it, put it on my table uh, as a table decoration. But it, it's made out of really good wood here. It can take a beating outside, so if you want to take it, throw it around in the dirt. It can handle the abuse, and uh, you wash everything in there. Heck yeah. Well, don't take that off quite yet. I'm not. I'm just moving it out of the way. All right, number seven is, and uh, we don't have these all in a particular bag here is a, a good little knife set um, for anybody really but if you like kind of the feel of the old school wooden knives you like that high carbon steel which is really really easy to sharpen this is a good set for you we call this our old hickory knife combo and you get several things in here it's six different knives you get a cleaver you get uh, is a seven inch butcher knife like that. This is my favorite right there, that slicing knife. That's a big boy right there. You get the six inch boning knife and then two paring knives. One is a four inch, one is a three inch. You can see those there. So nice little knife set there. Good made in the USA. Absolutely. Hickory handle on those. Um, if you know somebody that's setting up housekeeping, needlewoods or whatever, that'd be a great gift right there. Everybody can use a good Your knife. Your mama set. had one of these one time. If she had worn it slap, it lasted so long, it, it wasn't much, wasn't no metal left on it. She had it uh, all of my lifetime. I can, ever since I can remember, she had that knife. And then she loved that knife. I don't know what happened to it, but I should have kept it. She sharpened it so much, it wasn't, it wasn't a quarter inch from there to there. <laughs> <the way> it was. <laughs> War slap out. Uh, what we got next? This guy right here. Digging tool. This is a nice one, especially for new gardeners out there, but but uh, even experienced gardeners find this handy. I've been using uh, this guy a little bit in my no-till garden uh, to mess around. And this is similar to what you've probably seen called a hoary hoary knife, but it's a little better design because um, we were looking at a hoary hoary style tool to carry. This was five or six years ago and uh, found this one and liked this one better. So this end right here, you could you could sharpen that knife sharp if you wanted to. Uh, it doesn't come razor sharp. You got serrated here so you can dig in the soil. And what I really like is you got that kind of handle right there, gives you a little leverage. You ain't got to worry about your hand slipping down and uh, tearing it up. Nice, made in USA, and got a pretty good. Great little tool for sheath. transplanting. Got a sheath there for it, totally. Yeah, so. with a belt loop on it. Yep. Great little tool for transplanting. If you got a raised bed, if you got little pots you're gardening in, and you just want to kind of mix up some amendment in there, that's the way to go right there. Digging tool. Digging tool. The next one is uh, always popular micro boost. And it comes in two different. Uh, Size there it comes in quarts and also comes in gallons. That's a good little stock and stuff for there, a little quarter mm -hmm. micro boost. Yeah, everybody can need some micro boost. Everybody, it don't matter what kind of garden you got, everybody could benefit from some micro boost. And the next one is whole shirts. So, lots of different sizes. We just added um, triple X and Triple X. Quad, actually, no, we ain't got those in yet. We're adding some triple X and, and quad X on, on some new sizes. So what? Triple X and quad X. We're also adding extra smalls of size. A lot of people want to get these for the kids. But uh, we've got... Very comfortable shirts. Yep. Really, really comfortable shirts. They come nice and wrapped up for you like this. So you can stick them in that stocking. And just pick the one that's got the best saying on there or the best. We actually have one that has a wheel hook on there. So yeah, it says the all, right, all, all right, all right, all right. All right, all right. Pick out the one you want. So there are 10 great gardening gifts. Head on over. Get those for you. Just like we always say, if you order before 3 p.m. Eastern on a weekday, we're pretty much going to get it out that same day. So still plenty of time to get stuff in get my uh, for Christmas. First question today 
is from Dave's RV channel. And this is for Travis. He says, old people like to tell you to cover your plants tonight. Then they'll throw in there, you better get up early and take that plastic off before the sun hits it. The theory is, old people, he says, my theory is, old people can't stand for young folks to get sleep. So is it necessary to get that plastic off ASAP? I've always slept late and had no issues. So, so when he made this comment, there was kind of an interesting thread of comments that kind of followed along me and a couple other people. And, and I find this hilarious because I've often wondered, and I ask you the same thing. Uh, your dad's a perfect example. Why do some of these old people like to get up at 4.30 and 5 o'clock in the morning? There ain't nothing you can do at 4.30 and 5 o'clock in the morning. There ain't no point in getting up that early. You can't see. It's not. I can understand getting up and, and being out there working at daylight, but getting up at that early in the morning, there just ain't no point in it. There ain't no reason behind it. And Because um, you're hurting. <laughs> and you have laid there and you woke up and you're hurting and you got to get up and try to make things better. That's part of it. But, but I, I do agree with Dave. A lot of older people, they think, Anybody sleeps to eight o'clock that they just well, they, wasting the life are, away. I will agree with that. Wasting the life away. Yep. Um, back to the and then I have the opposite problem. My two little boys wake up uh, early like an old person does, and and they want everybody else to be up and come getting after it. Back to the plastic thing. Yeah, when I've covered stuff, um, I always I kind of look at it as like a a little mini greenhouse I'm creating and. Uh, if I know it's going to get cold the next night, I'll just leave it all on there. I, I think it kind of creates a warmer environment in there. So I, I'm not in usually in any hurry to, to take it off. No, now if there's that weird situation where it was really cold and it was going to get up really warm the next day, you probably need to get and make some provisions and get it off from there so it can breathe because it will get, it is possible to it turn off. It can get too hot in it there. It can get too hot in there. Excuse me, blister your plants. Okay, number two is from Lane Steel 240. He says, when are we getting those single-time cultivators back in stock? Our single-time cultivator has proven to be one of our most popular tools, and for good reason, it is a great one. However, we've had some problems, so we've sold so many of them this year, and our manufacturer has had some issues, and we're sporadically getting them in. When we get them in, within about two weeks, we're out again. We'll wait another month. We'll get another shipment in. We are working on some options there. I can't make any guarantees, but we are aware of the situation. There's a lot of customers are waiting on them, and we're working on some new manufacturing um, ways to get them out there and get them to you. So we're, we're aware of it, working on it, and that's about the best I can do. Yeah, unfortunately, that is a tool that almost has to be made by hand. And uh, for the volume that... that we have been moving them. It's it's hard to find someone that can make them by hand to keep up with the demand. Yep. Next one comes from KJ11. He says, what kind of beet should I grow in Louisiana and Michigan? No, and he meant, and in, am I too late to try to plant again? Am I? He was a shorthand. Oh, am I too late? Well, I don't know shorthand. Am I too late to plant again? That's like when you do when you're texting something, you don't, instead I'm of writing that. I'm not that, yeah. It, You'd rather wake up at 4.30. I'd rather really wake up at 4.30. So, um, not too late to plant beets. In fact, I'm probably going to start some in the greenhouse pretty soon as I'm cutting up, getting this lettuce out of there, going to replace it with some beets. My three favorite varieties currently, now I'm going to be uh, adding the vulture to this mix this time, trying those. My three favorite varieties um, are the kestrel. The kestrel is a, a kind of almost like a commercial beet variety. Uh, really good disease resistance, really good performance on it. Um, I like the Merlin. Merlin's probably the sweetest one we have. It's a really good performer for me. And then this Touchstone Gold. Got to have some of those gold beets in there. Um, just add some nice color to everything. So those are my three favorites. And I'm going to start some transplants pretty soon with these guys. Number four, Eric Cartwright. Have you considered offering free shipping on just seeds if you spend $25 or something like that? Eric, one of the things that we do is we ship out seeds most of the time, I'm going to say 90, 95% of the times, if you just order seeds, they go priority mail. And we charge shipping because it actually costs something to send them priority mail. But we think it's beneficial to use the customer to get them in a quick fashion. 
they are slower options we could do out there to save money and maybe cut down on the cost, but for no more than what it costs for the shipping that we charge on seeds, we feel like it's justified and we feel like the customer wants to order as soon as he can get them. And most of the time with priority, first class or either priority, you get them in three or four days, which is pretty quick. I mean, during the holidays, it could be a little stretched out there, but it's about the quickest you can get your order from when you order it. Yeah. Quickest shipping option we got. And we don't make any money off that. We just try to get your order to you as quick as we can. Yeah, whether you order one packet of seed or ten packet of seeds, it costs us on average five dollars to get that package to you fast, like we do, and uh, so that's what we charge. We don't make any money off. Yeah, that. If, if it really bothers you that much, just spend a hundred dollars and get free shipping. <laughs> one way to do it. All right, somebody's calling. All right, the next one says oh. the working man's garden. How about that? That's for you. Okay. Travis, have you had any issues with corn smut on your fall corn as opposed to spring and summer? That's a good question. I'm actually trying to grow corn smut as it is a delicacy. What, you're just going to skip over I'm that skip word? I'm skip over that word. I, I, I threw that one at you to see if I could catch you. But. <laughs> All right, well, I could, boy, I could really butcher that one up. <laughs> you want to just give it one No, try. I don't. As it is a delicacy in Mexico, and I've always tr wanted to try Wondering if fall would give me a better chance, thanks. I took quite a few Spanish classes in the day, and, and I, don't, I think the way you say that is wheat la coche, or well, You did it a lot different than what I would have done. <laughs> um, so wheat la coche, also known as corn smut. Now, I remember growing up when we would get together and put up corn, I'd see a lot of it. I haven't seen any in quite a while. Um, I don't, and I don't really know. I, my best guess is because we uh, we're spraying that copper on our corn when we're putting out spinosad. We're putting a fungicide on it, and, and that's the reason we don't get it. I'm not really sure. I'm not sure that would prevent it. Uh, I'm not really sure why. We used to see it a lot as a kid. I don't see it anymore. I don't know how you could actually try to get it. Uh, any ideas? Yeah, I do have some ideas. Quit, so quit, I know quit, for, quit, quit. <laughs> I know for a fact that UGA did some extensive research on this in their Blairsville Research Center out in Blairsville, Georgia. I just was just by there the other week. So you may want to go in there and see if you can Google something with UGA. I don't know if they did any publications on there. But I know a guy that was working there, and he told me about this. Uh, they did some extensive trials trying to replicate it and make it grow because they knew that if they could, they could develop a market for it. For what? Market for what? For the huchiente. <laughs> huchiente. Anyway, check that out. UGA's website may have something on there. If not, I do know one of the professors worked on it for a few years. All right. Last one's from Megan Singletary. <coughs> Excuse me. And she says, uh, Great show as always. Learn something new every time. Got to know where Greg's hat is from for my husband. He already has the Hall straw hat, which he loves, but uh, likes the one, likes that one right there. It's a Fitson. I love Fitson brand. The Fitson's expensive, and I'm by no means going to tell you that they're the best out there. But this is a Fitson hat. Been wearing one for years. This one's probably three or four years old. I love it. That's a warm hat, so you don't want to wear it in summertime. But for a wintertime hat, it's a darn good one. Yeah, I got a brown one like that. I um, I work a little harder than you do, and I get hot. I can't. It makes my head sweat. Yeah, you want to wear it when it's cold, and uh, it's kind of a dressy hat. You don't want to wear it out there, put wooden or nothing. Yeah, that's it's go to town eating hat. Go to town eating hat, but it, it's a nice hat. It goes good with your overalls and yeah. your uh, van. Yeah. So why do you why do you have to have two bandanas right there? That's not two. One? That's one that's bicolored, so you can switch around and get the other color the next day. So it's got two colors. It's red on one side and blue. I was on one like side. having double sided underwear. Yeah. Double side over, so you wear the blue one day, then turn around and wear the red. Get the blue dirty, wear the red. Keeps your neck warm on them cold days that wind's blowing. Ah, I see. Yep. Okay. One little side note, I talked to one of our seed distributors this morning, and I mm. thought I'd pass this on to the people out there. We're, we were talking about supplies and stuff, and he told me this right here. And this was interesting, I thought. He said, we're, they're seeing a shortage on English peas and beans. I said, what about our southern peas? Because we always worry about our southern peas. He said, believe it or not, Greg, we are seeing, you know, we're getting good feedback from the grow, and we think we're going to have ample supply of the southern peas. Now, they're going to be late as usual. Mm. But he said the shortage that they're seeing right now is in English peas and beans for the year. 
Yeah, you know, I can see that. If you think about the country as a whole, there's probably more English peas that are bought than there are field peas. Yeah, now, but down he said here the is, reason for that was there was two seed, big seed companies out west that was known for their peas, I mean, yeah, for their English peas and their bee varieties that went out of business in the last year. Mm. So he said that may be causing some issues with the supply chain. With the English peas? And the beans. And the beans. And the beans. I've heard some stuff on the beans. Uh, we're going to do the best we can there. Yeah. He said it was a tight market. No doubt about it, it was a tight. But that's the only thing that he's seen at the moment that was was shorter than anything else. We're going to get all we can. Yeah. I'll tell you that. All right. Well, I hope everybody enjoyed the show. And as always, if you have any questions about anything we talked about, any of the products, taters, new varieties, any of that good stuff, put those in the comments below. And we'll be glad to try to answer them for you. If you enjoyed the show, give us a big thumbs up. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button, ring that bell, so you get notified every time we come out with a new video. And if you did enjoy tonight's show, check out these other two videos right here. I think you'll really enjoy those as well. We'll see you next time. Take care.